soft violet light of some far-off tower hardly broke through the smog of the city. Massive industrial filters filled the air with the taste of iron as it processed these gigantic clouds and made them habitable. The streets were lined with neon buildings casting pastel colors on the silver roads of a destitute morning. Although it seemed more like the witching hour, it was around 8 o'clock. The light of the pale sun tried to cast its rays behind the layers of steel and fog that surrounded us, but it could not. Morning mist threw plumes of rust onto my jacket as my shoes clanked against the metal walkway of my apartment's adjoining alley. I made my way in haste as this time of day was forbidden for activity. Cameras swung right and I swung left, finding refuge in the shadows and the soot. The air whirled above me in that all too familiar and foreboding fashion. My pace quickened, but before long, the clouds opened up and like a vacuum, sound of rain dampened to a whisper. Suddenly, with a crash of thunder and a flash of red eyes, it jetted across the sky. Twirling around now, the automated monstrosity swung lazily overhead to find whatever mess awoke it from a mechanical slumber. I felt the anxiety rising in my stomach and clenching my chest. The sweat beaded off my forehead, and I struggled to keep from clenching my eyes closed. Quickly, I leaped to the cover of a nearby dumpster. The ground jerked, and I fought back the urge to whimper. Stay in the shadows, be quiet, and when it gets close, just hold your breath, I told myself. The blade-like nails rolled across the ground as it ignited the alley red like a camera darkroom. An iron vulture now made its way toward me, scanning intently for some defiant flame to be smothered. It would not stop until it found something. Ash and debris were thrown into the air as the beast cleaved enormous lacerations in its voracious search through the alley. Between each destructive blow, I danced quietly between rusted cans and degrading cars. Angry and ravenous, it tore them apart, hoping to find organic life hidden beneath the wreckage. I bided my time, and the city, surely enough, started to wake. Defeated and now out of time, the vulture shrieked agonizingly. As it opened its mouth, a cloud of green mist filled the air. I took a deep breath and held before it reached my face. With the blink of an eye, the iron vulture darted into the sky and was gone without a trace. My chest burned as I waited for the mist to clear, and I took a deep breath as the final twinkling particle dissipated. I would be worthless if I was to inhale the drug, just like the rest of this city. I rose and dashed toward the back entrance of my complex. Sprinting inside, I opened cumbersome doors leading to maintenance stairs not taken by people of my class. No one would be in them now. The lower class of cesium laborers would be tucked away in their huts unseen and unheard as the chromium were starting their workday. Dashing through staircases floor after floor, I made my way to the 42nd level. I cracked open a door and peered into the hall of identical rooms shining brightly in the glare of fluorescent light. Empty, I inched myself toward room number seven. Standing in front of the gleaming metal door, I took hold of the handle and felt a wave of relief rush over me. Twisting carefully so as not to make much noise, I heard the latches click within the complex mechanisms of the handle. Suddenly, I was jostled from behind. Two hands grabbed my shoulders and I felt my heart sink. I was so close. Spinning me around involuntarily, I prepared for the end. Instead of seeing my life flash before my eyes, I saw all I could have done, the future of this godforsaken place dying slowly as they stripped me of all that I have worked for. Evie, she squealed. What are you doing up this early? It's so unlike you. You are usually the last of the bunch to hobble into work, she said, analyzing my apprehensive glare. I looked like I crawled out of a sewer drain, like I had been rolling around in piles of wet, rusty soot in which, in a sense, I had been. I was hoping to get a few errands done this morning so that I wouldn't have to worry about them after we were let out tonight. I'd like to enjoy the weekend ahead, not just piddle it away with frivolous chores, I said in an obviously rehearsed manner for this exact situation. I am almost always overprepared. I have lines practiced for almost any undesirable run-in. This early? asked Tinny. The vultures have just turned in. You know how dangerous it is to be out before the allotted times. Tinny had an honest concern in the tone of her voice. Oh yes, of course. I would never be out this early unless I had a pass. I quickly flashed an outdated day pass from a work trip two years prior, hoping that she would not question me any further. I especially hoped that she would not actually look at the pass. Wow, Evie, can you show me how to go about getting one of those? I'm taking a bus trip next week and would love to be able to head out early. Of course, I responded, relieved at her predictable flightiness. I just have some loose ends to tie up this morning and I'll talk you through it later, knowing that she will forget any of the particulars of this peculiar meeting. Awesome, exclaimed Tinny. Just don't be as late as usual for a report today. You know how much it annoys Vincent and the others. With that, Tinny waved and walked toward the elevator doors. 
Having no idea how to apply for a pass, I was sure that I should have declined. I had only ever been given them for work-related jobs outside of regular hours. Still, I had no excuse as to why I would do such a thing, and being exhausted lost any creativity. If I have my way, I will only have to buy time for a couple of days anyway. I opened the door of my apartment and closed it swiftly behind me. Slumping onto the floor of my 12x12 studio and catching my head in my knees, I took a moment to gather myself. I knew that the exhausting days ahead of and behind me would be worth it. I reached into my jacket to reveal the fruits of my labor. Round and green, covered in hundreds of spiny needles, wrapped tightly in tissue paper. Life. Real, organic life. I had made my way outside of the heavily guarded walls of the city, into the underground depths of the cesium mines, and out into the world. The real world. The world of life and animals, the world that held secrets beyond the desert in which they built the city. I can make them feel better things, I can show them the breathing mountains and singing birds. It felt overwhelming to have them in my hands again. It had been so long since my previous opportunity. Knowing what I can do with them now has made the danger of the trip to the outside worth it. Just being free of the smog was worth it. Still, I had purpose. I wanted to show them that their complacency is the end of all things worth living for. The fog that permeates the city would no longer permeate their minds. I just wanted a few more samples and a few more days. I folded up my bunk and pulled the carpet from the floor. Lifting one of the metal latches I had installed and popping open the tiny door, I saw a year of work finally put to use. A shallow, cramped, well-lit, drug-synthesizing greenhouse with room for nine full plants if need be. More than enough for me to make what I needed. I stowed away the three I had smuggled into the city, lightly sprayed their supple, green flesh with water, and closed the latch. I laid the carpet back down, put the bed back into place, and felt a sense of accomplishment. I had beaten the odds this time. I stripped off my rusty, soaked clothing and practically fell into the shower. I cleaned myself quickly, dried off, put on my work jumper, and made my way out of my complex and into the street. The city clock blared its sirens for the start of the chromium workday. Late as usual, I navigated my way through the now bustling crowd, gazing up at the massive building where I was employed. A gray sky carpeted us amid the ebb and flow of switching workers. Looking at the crashing waves of men and women going about their routinely scheduled days, Dalek Tungsten oversaw the city and its inhabitants. Through the mountains of flickering screens, Tungsten monitored their movements. Not a motion went unseen, and with a flick of a switch or the push of a button, he could have anything or anyone he wanted directly in front of him playing out on his screens like a movie. Over a loudspeaker in his office, his assistant's voice pierced the silence. Good morning, Director Tungsten. I'm sorry to bother you so early, but Mr. O'Connell is here and would like to speak with you. Thank you, Jenny. Send him in. Tungsten responded apathetically, knowing all too well Vincent and Connell's incessant need to over-report his staff's goings-on. Vincent and Connell stormed in the room. Again, she is late again. Runs the entire synthetic stimulus department of medical intervention and has not been on time for the last year. Calm down, Vincent. We're speaking of Evelyn Galvanez, correct? Yes, of course, Miss Galvanez. Constantly late and never rested. Yes, she's always getting her work done, but I find her behavior annoying. You must understand, Dalek. You mean Director Tungsten. Tungsten retorted with a look of disdain. Uh, of course, Director Tungsten. Vincent scrambled to recover quickly and avoid the embarrassment of his insolent use of loose and overly friendly language. For the sake of the rest of my department, if synthetics falls under production, then everything else turns to shit. Let us not forget the last time the SSDMI went down. We practically had people sleeping at their workstations. I will speak to her, Vincent. Send her in when she arrives. Dalek waved Vincent to the door and returned to his screens. Standing in front of his monitors, Tungsten's mind started to wander. He knew that Evelyn was given too much leniency, but her extremely high intelligence and work ethic made it almost impossible for the city to function on the level it did without her. It was her creatively inventive nature that made the production of SSDMI improve tenfold. She was unique in a world of almost carbon copy similarities. Tungsten, in his own unique position, felt a connection with her, one that he had never felt with anyone else, though he would never admit it. He would do what he always did when Evelyn got called in for odd or disorderly behavior. He would reprimand her for what she was doing, commend her for all that she had done, and explain the bar that she had set for herself. 
same song and dance. Meanwhile, the average man or woman wouldn't dream to act in Evelyn's manner, not unless he or she wanted to be a shredded pile of bird feet at the feet of the iron vultures. Tungsten stared at the images jumping around on the screens in front of him. The Chromium Elite were performing the intelligent and thoughtful work of a high-class individual, from synthesizing in a lab to engineering machinery, complicated tasks not fit for Chromium hands. Then there were the Cesium laborers sleeping away the day in preparation for a night of arduous physical labor, cleaning the mess of the Chromium Elite, or working in the SSDMI mineral mines. Sickening, lowly creatures, Tungsten thought. Through the offices, I hurried to get to the lab as quickly as possible. Chromium Elite lined the halls and cast judgmental looks at me as I passed. I knew that I could not afford to keep bringing attention to myself. Getting absorbed in my extracurricular activities had definitely brought attention to my complex behaviors as Vincent labeled them. I got to my office, only to see none other than Vincent himself sitting in my chair, not so patiently waiting for my tardy arrival. Miss Galvanez, Director Tungsten would like to speak with you immediately. Vincent smirked with a menacing grin, barely hiding the deep joy he got from being a glorified professional tattletale. Of course, Vincent. I'm sorry about my tardiness. No excuses. Just overslept again. <laughs> Vincent spit back. Please make your way to his office immediately. I tried to gather myself and walked over to the elevator. The sparkling metallic walls of the lab cast my reflection next to me as I proceeded. I caught a glimpse of my reflection and saw the fear in my eyes. I needed to pull myself together and stay calm. Do not give him a reason to think you have something to hide. The glass door of the elevator slid open silently, and I got in alone. I pressed R, the door slid shut. The floor shot upward, and I was ushered to the top of the building in seconds. The elevator opened to a room of almost absolute darkness. The pitch black was cut only by a man's silhouette within a chamber of flickering light adorning the wall to the right of me. I felt the figure notice my presence, though I had yet to see him. I had been in this exact situation before. It felt less intimidating then. I did not have a hidden compartment with incriminating plant life in a makeshift drug synthesizing lab during the other times that I was summoned for my problematic behavior. I made my way out of the darkness and into the light. Dalek Tungsten stood motionless in front of the twelve-foot wall of monitors. His head slowly rotated like an owl scanning for a mouse. Evie. Tungsten said in an almost delighted tone. Please, come closer. His tired eyes looked like those screens pulled his very essence from his body. The soul of this man was being harvested by the luminescent wall. D Dalek? I stuttered, immediately regretting the delivery. You seem to have lost your nerve, Evie. Not very much like the girl I enjoy in most of these meetings. I sense a tremble in your tone. He walked slowly to my left now, staring blankly down at my feet and back up toward my head. Trying hard to change my overall demeanor, I sadly continued to stumble over my words. I, I just know how much I have been a nuisance as of late, and... I've heard unsavory things, Evie. Tungsten interrupted, bringing his face closely to mine. I saw him more clearly now. His eyes were swollen and red. A crimson dam had pulled and dried on his face. Little streams of amber rolled over the top of them, falling softly onto the floor as he spoke. I'm sure you're aware of how much someone of your intelligence is a threat to the city, if not kept at bay. He declared blankly. I did my best to muster something that sounded a bit more offended than defensive. I am not at all threatening, Dalek. I understand how tardiness can affect production, but I have never let it affect my work. I promise you that I mean no harm to- the production is not my concern. Your behavior is a topic of conversation. Tungsten interrupted again. To function at your level of aptitude, you would have to have some type of mixed emotions for the norm. The status quo must bore you, mustn't it? I made direct eye contact as to convey some type of extra assurance that I was telling the truth. Not at all, Dalek. It wasn't like that, you understand. Of course, as a scientist, I have to think. Yes. Tungsten interrupted yet a third time. A scientist free thinker, and not the average one at that. These things are necessary to create progress, but are strictly limited. How do you limit those thoughts, Evie? 
How do you spend your day trying to create nothing new, just a better version of the norm? How can you turn off? His tone started to rise, and his milky white eyes faded to gray and then black. How can you not, Evie? What is your goal here? To walk in circles? Protect yourself from the wind, the rain, and the atom bomb? What is the point? Answer me. Almost panting now, Tungsten did not wait for a response. These were the thoughts he had felt his entire life, questions he found welling up in his mind as he stared at the screen of his makeshift world. His position demanded intelligence and wit, but it came with a rule. Keep the machine running. It definitely did not call for feelings. He was revealing himself, as open and obvious as a nudist in church. Tungsten regrouped, looked at me again, and stated, Please, come. He reached out his hand, withered and shaking, with skin translucent like that of a burn victim. I took hold, and he guided me over to his wall. There's an extermination happening outside of the mineral mines today. Word spread of a small group of miners who felt that their rations were making their stomachs ill. They wanted to complain to their superiors about the problem, but we intercepted the conversation, and we are going to intervene at any moment. Stay here and watch. Tungsten waited for some type of emotional response. I was still in shock from his outburst. He never gave me a moment to answer, but the way he spoke made me feel like he was interrogating himself. Baffled, I stared at the monitors with him, not speaking a word. We were watching a small gathering of cesium miners. They looked sickly and malnourished, and it seemed like the healthier miners in their group were trying to get them to eat. Their emaciated bodies looked like crumpled pieces of paper. All of a sudden, there was a crash of thunder, the vacuous loss of sound, the flash of red beams and metal claws. Three iron vultures descended out of the sky and started to brutally dismember the sickly cesio miners. Their fragile bones snapped and flesh and muscle shredded like tissue paper. They were ripping them into pieces while simultaneously melting their scattered limbs into piles of ashy soot. The other miners ran in fear, knowing all too well how little could be done if they were to intervene. They too would be victims of the slaughter. The sound shrieked through the speakers and sawed into my head like a dull knife. I felt the wind leave my body, and my head got light. I caught myself from passing out and took a deep breath to stabilize my newly found equilibrium. Tungsten was no longer watching the screen. He was peering at me, unfazed by the massacre playing out on his screens. They are an example, he said emotionlessly. I don't understand. That is something that happens quite often to the Chromium Elite. We have people who get sick. Sometimes food doesn't agree with them. We just switch their diets. Why would you have these people killed? I suppressed the urge to scream. They are Cessia miners. That is why. They do not get to have the same resources a Chromium Elite has. They know that requesting anything is considered insubordination. By them asking for different food, they were asking to be given something for their comfort. Their class is not allotted comfort. They live and die for you and for the sake of the Chromium Elite. Such impropriety must be dealt with in this way. These things happen daily. I see, I responded hesitantly. My body quaked with grief, but I could not let that show. I had to stay analytical, factual, and keep my composure. Tungsten wanted a reason to watch me more closely. You see? Tungsten paused, scanning me again for any sign of something he considered out of character. If we let this go, then they might start asking for better hours. Maybe they will want benefits. Time off, more of what the Chromium Elite have. Then maybe the Chromium Elite will see their lives are not too different from the Cessium laborers. They start to want more, start to think of greater things, things outside of the protective fathering walls of this city. You aren't old enough to remember those times, but war and disease plagued the earth. You were either rotting away in your own filth or being blown to bits. This great city was made to protect us and keep our species alive. We blocked out the cancerous sun and burn all the plants. No birds fly in our skies to spread disease and no animals breed parasites on the ground here. The city is safe from life outside of our own. We filter the air and make every waking moment active for our people. You know firsthand the joy we bring each and every citizen through SSDMI. Life is simple. We are safe, and our medicine keeps us stable and happy. 
Struggling to breathe, I stared into Tungsten's eyes. With some hesitation, I answered, Yes, of course, Dalek. For the sake of society, we must maintain the rules of the city. The words felt like poison on my lips. They were recited lies, and I hated saying them. Tungsten's menacing look started to diminish, and a calm, almost defeated expression took its place. It was as if he wanted a different response. That, or perhaps I had confirmed all of his preconceived notions, and he was about to have an iron vulture burst through the ceiling and drag me away. Pausing for a moment, staring at me, Tungsten suddenly blurted, Thank you for your time and understanding, Evie. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Tungsten turned back to his screens, slightly shifting his gaze between floating images. Visit me again soon on better terms. I rather like our conversations. I was caught off guard by the sudden change in tone and immediate end of our meeting. I hoped he had just heard enough from me and was convinced to trust me. The nagging feeling in my stomach told me otherwise. I would be delighted to, Dalek. I will see myself out, I responded. I turned, got back onto the elevator, and shot back down to the SSDMI lab to start my shift. Tungsten heard the elevator drop and continued to stare at his monitors. He held the button for his assistant and spoke into his receiver. Jenny, I want more eyes on Evelyn Galvanez. My head wandered while my hand stayed firmly planted in the lab. I had grown quite accustomed to multitasking. Still, today was much harder than usual. Tungsten and his antics had really taken a toll on me. Normally, I performed all the necessary yet mundane tasks of my workday while my mind wandered to future plans and days in the clouds. I hadn't made any new discoveries or technological improvements in the last year and a half, but I did not want to. The images I had seen and the words Tungsten spoke clung to me like tar. They hindered my movements and slowed the passing of time. Painfully, the day etched on and finally came to an end. Each employee was given the same allotted pay. From the seemingly useless jobs like Vincent had, all the way up to Tungsten himself, the rate was the same. A bi-weekly pay stub and a daily supply of inhalants. A small metal box containing pressurized tubes of a sweet green vapor that was sure to placate and tame even the most rambunctious intellectual. Benzol, three doses a day, seven days a week, with an extra two for good measure. On this day, people looked as if ready to go on some new exciting adventure, elated to walk in the same drug-fueled circle over and over, day after day. It was my turn now. I took my stub and little tin box and walked out. I never took the inhalants, not since my exposure to the outside. At one point, I was just like the rest of the chromium elites and cesium laborers. It wasn't until just after my discoveries at the SSDMI mineral mines that everything changed. I was given the task two years prior to find a way to process the minerals needed to create benzol quicker and more efficiently. With the growing population, the rate we were producing the drug was not nearly quick enough. The city was starting to see trouble for the first time in my generation. I had been working on a machine that would start the process of synthesizing the drugs before they left the mine's transportation belts. At this point, even the chromium elite were affected by the lack of production and started to show signs of discomfort. The cesium laborers, who have always had double the amount of the drug allotted to them, were not being given more than a dose a day, some even just a few a week. If I hadn't created that machine, the city might have woke up on its own. I loathe my once self-righteous blindness. My party was a couple of other chromium engineering techs and a group of about 25 cesium miners. I felt proud to have the responsibility of saving the city and very confident in the work that I had done. The days turned to weeks, and as the machinery was installed, we had consistent issues with defiant cesium miners. There were times when 10 to 15 of them were nowhere to be found, and the installation of the mobile synthesis transportation machine was taking twice as long to install. We were finally nearing the final days of the work, and I myself was feeling the effects of little to no benzol rations. The mineral tunnels were frigidly cold, and I was dope sick with the lack of my medicine. There were more cesium miners missing than usual this day, and I was more agitated than I had been the entire project. I told my two engineers to stay put and keep an eye on the few laborers we had left while I ventured into the tunnels to bring back what I assumed was the lazy behavior of cesiums left under medicated. I walked hastily, shivering uncontrollably. The shimmering of the mineral tunnels gleamed into my eyes as my floodlight cast harsh rays onto their walls. Shuffling as fast as my frozen legs took me, I made my way through the darkness. In the distance, I started to hear them, small chattering of an indistinguishable nature. My pace quickened, and I realized that I was starting to get covered in sweat. 
My breath no longer created smoky streaks highlighting my path. Instead, I was starting to heave deeply, trying desperately to cool myself down. I stopped for a moment and stripped my layers, then continued on. The mumbling of incoherent words started to take form, and I realized that it wasn't the talk of lazy, uneducated laborers. It sounded as if I was approaching a pack of chromium elites out for a drink after a long day. There was cheerful laughing, and the conversation sounded interesting and intelligible. I felt a warm breeze caress my face, and as I rounded the corner, I was overtaken by light. Through an open hole above me, I saw, for the first time in my life, the vibrant, blue-painted sky of the desert. I climbed the makeshift wooden pegs of the ladder, reaching into what seemed like heaven. I heard the voices stop immediately as the creaks of the rungs rang out through the tunnels and into the open air. My head peeked out into the calm, almost cloudless day. Sixteen cesium miners stood motionless as I pulled myself to the surface of the hot desert floor. I hardly noticed them. I was too consumed by the overwhelming emotions of an uninhibited experience in nature. I had no drug to make me complacent and uncaring, and even if I did, it couldn't possibly have worked. I was enamored with a world I could never have imagined, nor even tried to at this point in my life. Cascading hills of golden sand rolled on the ground, littered with luscious greenery poking out of scattered expanses. The blazing sun had a light unlike anything I had ever seen before. The warmth made me feel as though I could breathe for the very first time in my entire life. Suddenly, I was jolted back to reality and remembered why I had been there. I looked over at the group, still immobilized by fear. How? How could you have known where to find this place? I asked, choking with emotion. An old laborer with a large white beard stepped slightly toward me while maintaining his distance. We have always known of this place. At least the elders do. These young men and women with me are seeing it with fresh eyes, just like yourself. With the lack of benzol, our minds return to us, and the earth calls out. You couldn't possibly have knowledge of this. You were a cesium laborer. Tungsten himself couldn't possibly imagine a place such as this. If he knew... I paused. He knows, doesn't he? Of course he knows, Evelyn. The city could not do what it was built to do if the people were aware of life outside of its walls. It was built in an effort to keep us safe and hidden. More than anything, hidden. Said the old man. I stood there bewildered, hoping the answers to the millions of questions in my head would fall into my lap. How are you so aware? Could Benzol really inhibit life this much? How much of my life is a lie? Then, before I could formulate any thought completely, I exclaimed, You know my name. We do not speak of our names to cesium laborers, nor would they ever directly address a chromium elite. I was jolted by the revelation, and for a confusing moment, felt sad for the first time at what felt like a flaunting of my superiority. I did not understand, but was sure that it was the lack of benzol perplexing me. Please, Evelyn, come with me. The cesium elder held out his hand to me, and I took hold. I had never felt the touch of a cesium before. It did not feel any different. His hand was the same as mine, just calloused from a life of hard labor. He took me over to the group of cesium laborers and motioned for one of them to go grab something. The young girl grabbed a machete from the ground and walked over to a small bluff, slicing swiftly into a misshapen looking plant. A liquid started to pour out of the sides and she collected it into her hands, running back to the elder and putting it into a dish in front of him. The elder added some powders, muddled them around for a few moments, grabbed a leaf, and smeared the newly created paste to it, sitting it in the sun. It dried almost instantly and turned into a hard, thick crust. He broke it down into a fine, violet powder and added the majority to a small satchel given to all cesium laborers. He licked his fingers and placed them in the powder. Reaching up, he wiped the residue under my eyes. I felt a sensation move from my feet into my spine and settle in the nape of my back. Then, in a most ethereal moment, I was thrown into the sky. The rush of the air gave me chills as I careened through the atmosphere, barreling upward until I arrived at the limit of oxygen's reach. The pale blue ring that caressed the earth held me tightly as I floated high above any questions I could have ever had for the Elder. Slowly, I drifted back down into the skyline and laid on pillows of clouds. I looked down to the earth below and saw huge bodies of water dancing in the sun, bordered by land of the same magnitude. I kept floating lower and lower. There were small twinkling beams of light shining in far lands that I was told did not exist. The earth was not chewed up by disease, war, and famine like we had been told. It looked brilliant and filled with endless wonder. 
I soared even lower now, swinging back and forth in the sky. I found myself hanging over top of brilliant mountains, giant lumbering beasts jutting out from the earth that swayed with me as I fell. They watched me lovingly as I approached their icy caps. I heard them inhale deeply and release bellows of air, guiding my free-falling body away from their peaks. Beautiful songbirds of all shapes, sizes, and colors flew near me now, singing vibrant melodies. The force of their numbers converged below me and eased me down to the tree line of massive forest so encapsulated by greenery that I could not see the floor under the treetops. Suddenly, they whipped me into the air and I found myself back in the desert. I was flung from their backs into the warm sand, tumbling slowly to a halt right at the feet of the elder Cessium laborer. I was dumbfounded. So much of what I had yearned to understand just a moment prior was now clear. I had seen more in what felt like the blink of an eye than in my entire life. I sat erect, still on the ground, and looked up at the elder. He held out his hand to help me off the ground. I reached out and touched his wrinkled face and felt the tears welled up in my eyes. I could not speak words eloquently enough to thank him for the places he had shown me. I embraced him tightly, hoping that the gesture would express some kind of gratitude. I felt the elder's kindness radiate from him as he brought me over to a patch of round, green plants covered in hundreds of spiny needles. You can leave with us, he said, speaking into the plants as he gently harvested them. The dome will not accept us back. If we went to our homes underground or in the mineral tunnels to work, we would surely die. Our hearts would not take the transition back onto Benzol, nor would we want it to withstand such torture. Where will you go? I said. The earth bears all the fruit we need. We will leave the desert and travel west. There are others. We have seen them high above the desert. I know you have as well. Will you come with us? Said the elder. Without hesitation, I looked into his eyes. I can't, though I desperately want to. The city has no idea of the real life outside of the metal dome that encapsulates them. I would be abandoning them when I know I have the means to help. I took a long, reflective pause. I can cure their minds. Making my way into my apartment, I threw the tin box of inhalants on my desk and walked over to the bed. Lifting it up and pulling back the carpet again, I grabbed the metal latch, twisted it, and heard the hiss of the compressed air release. The door swung open to the three perfectly supple plants. I grabbed the water and sprayed them again. Placing the bottle back onto the counter, I got to work attaching wires and tubes, calibrating the machines, and preparing them to start their true purpose. A drip of liquid fell onto a petri dish and dried immediately. Powder was then sucked up into a glass cylinder to the side of the plants. It was ready. I set a timer, closed the latch, replaced the carpet, and put the bed back into place. I had two more hours until the Cessium miners would be back to work. The Chromium Elite were busy enjoying the start of their weekend of drinking, dancing, and uninhibited pleasure. The city's dark alleys and even darker tunnels were open for me to traverse without much interruption. Making my way out into the back alley of the complex, I went down the side streets in the gloomy evening air. The nights here had no danger. There was no crime for those who stayed in the norm. On the other hand, I was nowhere near where I should be. If anyone was to see me, there would be no explaining it away since I should be enjoying the night with friends. What I was doing above ground was not illegal, per se but it was very odd and would definitely involve an investigation if I was caught. A chromium elite caught in the mineral mines for no reason would surely be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I was now out of the chromium district and got through without a hitch. Currently, in the slums of the Cessium laborers, they were still asleep with a little more than an hour to go before they had to report to their positions in the mineral tunnels. I had quietly walked through the huts of the Cessium laborers, making my footsteps light but fast. I was just outside the tunnel entrance. Once I hit the protective walls of the mine, I started to sprint, running at full force without restraint. I pushed myself to complete physical exhaustion, cutting through intersecting tunnels and going deeper into the mines. I reached the warm breeze of the desert cavern. 
I shined my light into the cave to find the ladder piled in heaps where I had left it. Putting it back together, I started to raise it piece by piece to the ceiling. Foot after foot and hand after hand, I made my way to the top. The sky overhead brought me such comfort. I had to stand and take in the earth as it was. The stars shined brightly on a cloudless night without a single street lamp to interfere with their glowing beauty. What a world they will see, I thought to myself, taking out my blade, cutting into the ground, and throwing dirt to the side of me. One by one, I pulled up six new, plump, spiny plants. I gently wrapped and placed them carefully into my bag, so much work for what amounted to a couple of minutes on the surface. I lowered myself back down the hole and onto the ladder. Foot after foot and hand after hand, I made my way back down. I hit the ground floor with a loud thud, skipping the last few rungs with a little jump that kicked dust into the air. The mine lights kicked on and the entire cavern was alive now. On each and every corner of the walls sat an iron vulture. At least a hundred of them stared with beaming red eyes directly at me. Weighing my options, I looked to the height of the ladder and thought of the terrain above. I could never beat them to the top. I had no place to go. Through the wall of monsters, I heard a voice. Evie, said Tungsten frankly. Hello, Dalek. You had promised me that you meant no harm to my city. Tungsten said with an annoyed tone. I stand by that, Dalek. I mean no harm to the people of the city, just the life that the people in it are living. They deserve more, Dalek, and I am sure you know that. They are safe here, Evie. Most of them would choose to stay even if they had the option to leave. And with the safety of the rest of the city at stake, they could not possibly have that choice. He responded. Safety from what, Dalek? A diseased world of war and famine? I've seen the world you speak of. You know nothing. You are lost in your screen, sedating generations to keep them unaware of a better place. I know nothing? Tungsten barked back, leaning forward into my words. His rise in anger set the iron vultures into movement from their stoic demeanor. They squawked and flapped their wings, hissing for ripe meat to be shredded and burned. I was born into a role just like you, Evie. Looking outside of the status quo is asking for the end of our kind. Tungsten repeated the words engraved into him by a lineage of other directors. No, Dalek. I am sorry, but you are wrong. There are others, I exclaimed, standing my ground, looking into the hundreds of red glares. What do you mean, there are others? Tungsten's tone started to change. Knowing that he could not possibly understand, I found myself trying to explain true wonder. Whatever the case, I had to try and buy as much time as I could. I have seen the lights of human life, things created only by cognizance. Watched and heard the birds sing and the mountains breathe. The earth is not scarred with the bites taken by the mouth of the atom bomb. The world lives, Dalek. There was only silence now from Tungsten. He could not perceive what I told him. I would not believe it either if I had not witnessed it myself. The snarling birds brought me no fear, except the loss of what I would consider my life's true work. The people of my city seeing the truth of the world outside of their cage, I held my ground, unwavering. It makes no sense, Evie. To accept what you are saying would make my entire existence pointless. All I have done to keep order would make me an unforgivable monster. The iron vultures parted, and I saw Tungsten at a distance, pacing slowly toward me now. As he walked, the questions he had asked me flared in his mind, bringing to surface a lifetime of smothered morals sacrificed at the altar of the greater good. He kept walking and said nothing to me. When he got directly in front of me, he looked up the ladder into the starry night. Tungsten fell silent for a moment, lost in their tantalizing shimmer. I cannot believe what you say, Evie. Turning his face from the heavens back to me. It is okay, Dalek. I reached out and clenched his hand looking into his angry, confused eyes. I had enough time. Dalek Tungsten, lost in a world of questions, turned from me, and I heard the ground shake with the sound of thunder. Hundreds of red eyes darted into the air as he started to walk toward the tunnel system. Through the vacuous silence of the iron vultures and the raining down of dagger-like claws, I heard them. The songbirds were singing out for me. On the 42nd level of the Chromium District Elite Complex, in room seven, a timer faintly beeped behind its locked door. The bed was down, the carpet was covered, and the latch was locked. 
Through a tube leading into the ventilation system from the greenhouse below crept a soft, violet vapor. Out into the air ducts, the concentrate spreads. In just a moment, the entire complex was filled and the vapor started to pour into the city surrounding it. The giant metal fans circulated the air. Evelyn Galvanez was always overprepared.